So good morning or good afternoon. Uh, Talent Finders would like to welcome former Assistant Special Agent in charge of U.S. Department of Justice and President of Celebrity Consulting Group, Wesley Tabor. So welcome, Wesley. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So firstly, um, I would like to congratulate you on all your achievements. Can you share with us more about how your career journey started and what led you to becoming a special agent leading to a position of massive responsibility and being in charge at the U.S. Department of Justice? Sure. You know, I started out in local law enforcement at a sheriff's office in 1992 in Florida, north of Tampa, Florida. And law enforcement was very different at that time, as you can imagine, the things that are happening now. You're in the UK and you've seen great changes in the law enforcement over the past decade. So I started 30 years ago. So if we look back 30 years, what was the UK like back then? I, I'm not sure, but I do ask you that question real quick. If you could tell me super quick, like how much has it changed in the last 30 years? No, I mean, it's changed a lot, you know, but also I think it's, it, there are a lot of challenges because like you say, you also get like um, cuts in the police force and whatever. So yeah. there have been uh, some of the departments have like closed or some of the stations have closed due to um, uh, government concerned. cuts. Yeah, well... Back when I started, there was a big push to to crack down on crime in the United States. So yeah. police departments are hiring all over the place. And that continued to progress into the the mid and late 90s with, with the Safe Streets Act, which Bill Clinton passed back in, I believe it was 96, 97, somewhere around that area. Yeah. And basically that was in response to heavy crime and drug use. Okay, okay. so drug dealing and drug use uh, which was a little bit different, obviously, in the UK and, and other countries around the world. The United States had some severe problems. Uh, but in relation to where you're at, the problems were a little bit more drastic because some of the, some of the pockets that we had coming directly from uh, South America and the cocaine that was being brought up exploded with a lot of homicides and a lot of drug trafficking that was extremely violent. For example, Miami, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York. Yeah. And the death toll was rising. So the U.S. government had a great response in that uh, they did a legislative action, which was to increase penalties for crime, which now is being looked at as something that they shouldn't have done. We should have looked at a multi-phase approach, and we could talk about that later. Yeah. Drug addiction, right? Yeah. So as a police officer in 1992, when I first began, I, I saw the firsthand effects of, uh, of narcotics and what it did to people's lives yeah and and the violence and everything associated with it and that i had known from the time i was young to digress just a little bit that I, that's what i wanted to do i was a police explorer in st paul minneapolis uh, minnesota back in the early 80s when i was yeah. a young kid which is part of the boy scouts it's a great mentoring program where law enforcement officers took us under their wing and kind of showed us what law enforcement was mm -hmm. so i had a notion of what law enforcement was and i decided at a very young age that I wanted to dedicate my life to that. So when I graduated from the academy in 1988, wow. started a police force when I was in 1992. Yeah. Back then, you could go and independently go through a police academy, and the system was very open back then. And it's a little bit more restrictive now. Uh, some of the self-sponsored stuff is restricted, and police departments typically hire you, put you through the academy, and put you to work. I did not do that. In 1988, I went through the academy, paid for it myself. Mm. And when I graduated, I was 19 years old, uh, which is state law in Florida. You have to be 19 years old in order to be a police officer. And I was actually 18 when I was in the academy. And halfway through the academy, the director called me in his office, a former Tampa police officer. Mm. And he said, how old are you? And I said, well, I'm 18. He said, oh, my God, you're 18. Oh, Jesus, you're, <laughs> you're not 19. What are you doing? You can't be here. I said, Sir, I'm graduating, hopefully, in two uh -huh. months. I turn, I turn 19 in March, and I was graduating in like June, May or June. Uh -huh. He said, keep your mouth shut. Don't say a word. <laughs> I'm watching you. So wow. I turned 19, I graduated, I went across, you know, and I shook his hand, and he just gave me that look like, all right, you know. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I, I was actually not, I didn't meet the criteria to be in the academy, but I did. 
And then wow. it took me a couple of years uh, to kind of find a job. I was so young. No one really wanted to hire a 19 year old kid. I was, a, I was 19 years old and wow. it was difficult to go through the process where they would take me serious because, because I looked very young. And so finally I, I got a great break and I joined a uh, sheriff's office just north of Tampa and uh, began my career. And, wow. you know, when you first join a force, you go through what's called a field training, which you're, you know, you're with another police officer for about three or four months. They change out different officers as you go through. Yeah. And so I went through the three month period. I came out and then I was on my own and just, it was such a wide opening experience. I thought I had kind of known what law enforcement was, mm. but until you, uh, get into it and you start seeing the daily barrage of violence and, and desperation in people, including, you know, what is caused oftentimes by drugs and narcotics. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's violence, domestic issues, uh, things like that, accidents, mm. you know, the suicides, uh, we would have multiple suicides weekly. I was going to suicides every week, multiple occasions, wow. uh, children, women, men, older people, you name it. And, yeah. you know, I mean, some of these would, they would do actually in front of you. So you would respond to the scene of a despondent individual and you try to talk them down and they would shoot themselves or, oh my God. you know, or something like that. So it became very difficult at times to kind of get through uh, the day. You yeah. know, you're super busy. People are trying to hurt you or kill you. You're responding to these people in need and you really don't have the effective time periods to deal with it. Oftentimes it's very difficult to yeah. spend time in the community. And that developed a little bit later in my career where they came up with community policing mm. where they try to, and they still are, and they still try and they still work with uh, communities mm. that they police in, in order to have a more effective relationship. Right. Yeah. So, and that's something that progressed over the years uh, and they still have today. And you could see the social shift is turning more from enforcement to more of a community policing type model where we want to be a little bit more, I say, you know, relationship bound rather than, you know, I'm the police officer, you're the offender kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Which is good, which is good and which is bad, right? So you have to have that balance mm. of those two. Yeah. So uh, over the next six uh, plus years that I was in uh, local law enforcement, I had gone from patrol officer. I was a street crimes detective, uh, which is like an anti-crime unit, which is a very important unit. Of course. It's a plainclothes unit that for people that don't know, a plainclothes unit that looks for crimes before they happen. And you look at different indicators and exper experienced police officers can kind of tell what is going to happen before it happens. They can okay. anticipate things. Yeah. For example, if we had robberies that were occurring in a certain sector of a city, we would conduct surveillance of these areas and try to predict through analytical data where the next robbery would occur. Mm -hmm. And we would try to take presence in that area along with the uniformed officers. And if we saw something that was going to happen, we'd try to interdict that before it happened. Right? Wow. So we did that with a variety of crimes, whether it's burglary, smashing grabs, ATM theft, um, you know, uh, robbery, you know, we did that on, on various levels or homicides. Mm. We had a homicide subject. Uh, oftentimes we would co conduct surveillance on them with an airship where we would be very clandestine and we would follow the individual that was suspected of killing people. And we would have an airship that would be in the far, far distance telling us where he is. And we would shadow that individual uh, for hours and hours and hours. So it was very unique position for me. And I learned a lot about surveillance, which would come in handy later as I joined the Drug Enforcement Administration, which is yeah. the, second of the Department of Justice. So after I left street crimes, I went into detective div uh, division and I was doing primarily property crimes. I did some person's crimes because it's typically it's, a, it's like a stepping stone to get to the next step, which is going to be homicide or robbery, homicide and so forth. Uh, and I was on a SWAT team. So for us, uh, the special weapons and tactics. So we respond to hostage situations, uh, suicidal subjects that were endangering the public uh, and so forth. So uh, that was a wonderful experience to go through the FBI SWAT school at Cape Canaveral. And we're, you know, we're doing all these exercises and ruck runs and all these obstacle courses that were, you know, 14, 15 mile obstacle courses 
through Cape Canaveral in Florida with all of the old rocket stands from the 60s and 70s. It was very cool experience uh, going into wow. the tunnel. The tunnels underneath, there's a labyrinth of tunnels and things like that that we were in doing different exercises, uh, gas mask drills and shooting drills and all those things. So a uh, very, very, very well put on school by the FBI with repelling techniques and so forth, which I had already done out of helicopters and things like that when I was on the SWAT team with the sheriff's office. But this was uh, a great teaching uh, moment when when I had these instructors that were instructing us. Many of them were former special forces and FBI agents that were working full-time SWAT for the FBI and some part-time SWAT. So that was a wonderful experience. And then I, obviously I was still, then I went back to my detective bureau, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities, uh, working burglaries and things like that. And, and a lot of people like, well, that must've been very boring. Well, you know, it could be boring, but then again, I'll tell you a little story about something that made a huge impact on a person. We had a burglary that occurred in which a some antique jewelry was stolen from this older woman. And when we met with her, she was crying in tears, you know, and we don't respond to the initial call. We respond after the patrol units get the information, they process the scene, or they'll have a technician process the scene, and then they write the reports. We get the reports a, a week later, and then we go and we start doing our investigation. And when I met with her, she had tears in her eyes, and she said, I don't care about the value of the jewelry other than the intrinsic value because my great-great-great-grandmother's ring was stolen. It was a dome ring, and there's a lock of hair from every daughter and grand uh, grandparent, grandmother, inside the dome of this ring going back like five generations. Gee whiz. And she described this ring. She showed me a picture of it, and, and I felt horrible. She's like, I, I, I've just lost like six generations worth of uh, history in this ring, and I'm supposed to do mine and my daughter and her granddaughter. And she was just, you know, just breaking down. Mm. And I said, well, let me, let me see if we can find this ring. So I did what detectives do, and we started canvassing and talking to informants and pawn shops and all these things. And eventually we recovered the ring and made an arrest. And when we brought the ring back to her, she was just like, you know, so happy. <laughs> wow, that's you know, amazing. She's like, oh my God, I, you know. <laughs> so you might say like a burglary case or a theft case as a detective, it's really nothing. Well, you make a big difference in people when certain things are stolen. Of course. Such, such and value. it's meaningful to them, right? Oh, it was, she was just like, she got weak need and I had to help her sit down. She was an elderly <laughs> woman. Sad. But I mean, this is generations. Yes. On, you know, so that's a cool little story that, uh, I like to tell people about, you know, the impact you can make in little ways that are big ways for other people, right? So, exactly. And now, during this time uh, of being a detective and working at the sheriff's office, uh, I had worked a lot of drug investigations, and, and I liked them. I liked working the drug investigations. It was very rewarding for me. And uh, that's why I decided to go and apply to the U.S. Department of Justice Drug Enforcement Administration, which I did. It took two years to go through the process. It's very wow. lengthy. At that time, it was very lengthy, uh, just over two years. And you go through screening and polygraph and drug testing and psychological assessment. And I mean, it's a lot. Your physical fitness agility test is, is pretty demanding. Now, wow. Some of those things have changed now. Wow. But after the end of the two years, they called me up uh, a few weeks before Christmas and said, we have a job for you. You have to be there in two weeks. Can you do it? Gee. Typical. Typical wow. Uncle yeah. Sam. You know? <laughs> and I said, I knew if you, if you say no, like, oh, I don't know if I have time, hey, forget it. They're not calling you back, right? They got a yeah. list. You know, back then I want to say there were about 10,000 applicants out of the Miami field division uh, mm -hmm. at that time. And, you know, they're taking, you know, not even 1%, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like you, you get in wherever you can. Yeah. And I said, sure. <clears throat> Then I said, oh, I better tell my captain on the police force, you know, and uh, luckily I went to him and he's like, hey, take it. That's great. Yeah. Good for you. You're giving us two weeks. That's that's all you can do. They're putting you in this spot. So don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And, and so, you know, I was swore in. I want to say it was uh, 21, 22 December uh, 1997. I was sworn in, in Tampa. I went into the office of the assistant special agent in charge at that time. His name was Michelotti. His last name was Michelotti. Mm. He had a big picture behind his desk of all these kilos stacked up behind him. And he's smiling. And the picture is a young agent. 
Mm. I was like, wow, look at all that cocaine, you know, it's like, wow, that's a huge, huge drug bust. Mm. Very intimidating. And he said, raise your right hand, which I did. And I took the oath and he swore me in. Now they don't swear you in until after you get out of the academy. But at that time it was a little bit different. So then yes. I went to the academy January of 1998, a few weeks later. So, which is a five month academy. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough academy. Uh, it's, you know, I was there in January in Virginia, Quantico uh, Marine Base. Mm -hmm. At that time, we shared dorms with the FBI. So our first run was a nine mile run into the woods and it was sleeting and snowing and wow. we were running on tank tracks, you know, which tank tracks are, are very rigid because it's compressing the soil and mud. It's very clay, mm -hmm. uh, clay uh, soil. Yeah, and, yeah. There, and it was frozen. So people oh, are wow. you know, twisting their ankles and hurting their knees. <laughs> and, uh, and then you can't de deviate off the track. So the track goes like this. And there's every time you go down, there's about a two foot of uh, water with ice on top. Yeah. So we're running through that for oh, nine months. God. And then we get into the middle of uh, the woods. Mm. And they say, okay, everyone, we're going to do push-ups and sit-ups for the next half hour, which we did. We did push-ups, sit-ups, jumping jacks for about a half hour wow. in the freezing cold, and then we ran back. So you're talking, it was a, it was a long day. That was our first day, our first physical fitness uh, day. And that kind of set the tone for, for the demanding physical aspects uh, of the academy, right? Yeah. And so... That continued throughout the remainder. Everyone lost, you know, and I was in great shape when I showed up, but I lost almost 30 pounds. Everyone lost a lot of weight. Wow. Period of time. And as you're sitting in class, if you fall asleep, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you're, you're exhausted. You're getting up at 4.30 to get to the pool or get, you know, we would do uh, uh, physical fitness drills by the pool that was super hot. And then we go outside and run in the cold. And then we come into a classroom that was warm after you eat. And you basically had, you know, 15 minutes to go eat, shove food down your throat and get back into class. And then you had to go to another physical fitness thing. So it was just a crescendo after crescendo of physical wow. you know, demands, you know, as well as the <laughs> mental demands of the school. But it was, it was great. great Not experience. for the faint hearted. Yes. You know, and, and you have to shoot. And when you shoot, I was very accustomed to shooting after being yeah, uh, the police SWAT team and the police and all that. So that didn't affect me. But some people had some issues. And there are times when if you don't shoot the qualification course up to standard, they just send you home. Uh -huh. uh, we had people that didn't make the times on the two mile run and they just sent them home. So uh -huh. there's no forgiveness. It's like, yeah, make it or you don't. Right. Okay. So I get out of the academy. First place they send me is Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines, Iowa, corn country. And people were like, wow, that must have been so boring. And it was just the opposite. Wow. The office had gone from a two-man office to mm -hmm. three groups and a task force, a HIDA task force. So we're, it went basically to a 40-man office uh, in a matter of a year. Mm -hmm. Senator Grassley, who is a current Republican senator out of Iowa, had a lot of power. And his state was being ravaged by the plague of methamphetamine. Oh, wow. Methamphetamine, they were making methamphetamine. We had uh, upwards of five, 600 labs or more uh, a year in Iowa. So these labs are very dangerous where they make the methamphetamine. People are blowing up their houses, blowing up trailers, burning themselves. And it was, it was utter chaos. And this was the time when the Mexican cartel started flooding the Midwest with uh, methamphetamine. So it was extremely dangerous, extremely a uh, hard time to be in that area. I was working constantly, but it was a great learning experience. Of so course. then I left, I left Guatemala, I left uh, Des Moines, Iowa, I went to Guatemala, mm. quite, quite the transition. And I worked Central American uh, narcotics traffickers and South American traffickers that were using Central America as a bridge for the United States through Mexico. Yeah. And that opened my eyes, jungle missions, air intercept operations, all these things, uh, we were seizing large amounts of money, seized $20 million cash. I had my car one time, just suitcases full of $100 bills. And $20 million is a lot of money. And you can imagine, you know, my- So what do they do when they, can I ask a question, when they seize the money, what do they do with that actual money? Well, that they... money, that, that's a very good question. So that money is taken and it's collated in the U.S. Department of Justice funds. Mm -hmm. 
for every agency within the Department of Justice for narcotics cases, narcotics training for narcotics related items. It's okay. a pot of money that it all goes to. It's not controlled by DEA. It's not controlled by me. It's not controlled by anyone. It's controlled by the U.S. Department of Justice. Okay. Now, local departments that are on our task forces are put in for what's called a DAG. And a DAG is basically they get a percentage of that money to mm. support narcotics investigative related cases in their communities. That does come off the top. It's a standard percentage uh, off the top, 20% goes to these local agencies, it's divvied up between them. So if you have, you know, uh, three agencies, uh, each one's gonna get roughly, you know, 7%. And, and then the rest just goes to US Department of Justice and that's it. So it's okay. not like the local offices take that money and say, ah, you know. It, <laughs> yeah, that's what that, I was wondering. How that, I... that appearance of uh, improper seizures, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. amazing. It has, it has to go through scrutiny. So you have to write up an affidavit, you have to you know, the opposing individual you take that from has the opportunity to, to fight that seizure in court mm. and the judge reviews it and so forth. So there's a lot of checks and balances. I know it, it gets a bad rap, but you know, if someone's a true narcotics trafficker and you're seizing his money, I think that's a good thing. In of the course. End, right? Otherwise you end up in the wrong hand. <laughs> that's right. And it, it, you know, it, promulgates what they're trying to accomplish with their mission. So we want to remove that from them and deny them that, that funding. Yeah, for sure. So I was in Guatemala for four years. So it was a great yeah. experience. I had learned Spanish and, and I then went to Chicago and from there where I was my first supervisory position, I had a task force with uh, uh, Chicago uh, suburbs uh, police. Mm -hmm. as well as some agents, and that was a crazy place. Really? Capo Guzman well, and his, his Sinaloa cartel uh, dominated, still does, uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the, the deaths, the kidnappings, the narcotics that we were seizing there, the money we seized in the first year and a half, probably around $28 million cash. Wow. You know, we would go into these homes, and they'd be, you know, armed and so forth, and then you'd see tables spread out with money counters on them and people just sit there getting paid to count money all day long Jeez, that's their only job so in the very very violent um you know uh, some houses we would go into have ak-47s and shotguns and rifles and things like that so after doing that for three years uh -huh. i then transferred to caracas venezuela as the country attache so i was the lead for dea in that country which is a great experience for me, probably one of my better experiences as far as being a supervisor that was able to do a lot of the street work himself. Yes. So it was a small office. I had uh, one point, only two agents and three support personnel. So it was a very small office. And that office, if you know the story about Venezuela, with the rising of power of Hugo Chavez, mm. and the coup and so forth, and then his, the coup in 1992, his imprisonment, he comes out, and then in 1998, he's then elected, and then he slowly starts implementing socialist programs, which really turn into almost like a communist kind of dictatorship, which it is today, yes. through the progression over years, and he destroyed the country, and they kicked out the Drug Enforcement Administration, technically, in 2005. However, for political reasons, he maintained uh, he allowed us to maintain a presence in Caracas. So when I got to Caracas, Venezuela, mm. my job was to assist in making cases on the big people in the country and makes, to make the arrests and to get people back into the United States on extradition, which was uh, the most critical thing that the U.S. government uh, was uh, requesting at that time. We wanted to bring them back to the United States. That's one of the the biggest things about the United States is our laws with conspiracies and so forth are very flexible for us to arrest individuals anywhere in the world mm. and bring them back and hold them accountable within the United States. Yes. Uh, it, it, for example, in the UK, conspiracy is a very touchy item mm. in the UK law. So it's not the same as the United States, and I'm not an expert in UK law whatsoever. Hmm. But to in, to go and get an arrest warrant for someone in the UK, uh, within the UK justice system for conspiracy and arrest them in, say, Colombia is very, very different than it yes. is in the United States. 
States. It's much easier in the United States to do that by means of our laws, which makes us very powerful. Yes, of course. And, and that's something that's critical for the American people to know that we have that ability. So, and I had, boy, we had taken out uh, probably four consolidated prior, priority targets, which are kingpins mm. um, through arrest operations, which I won't get into here, but uh, very dangerous uh, at times and, and things went very well, luckily, and we got these individuals back to the United States to face justice. We're talking people from the North Valle Cartel in Colombia. Does that, uh, uh, you know, so these, these are very dangerous individuals that were moving hundreds of tons of cocaine to the United States and Canada and Europe. And of course, we held them accountable for their actions that were affecting the United States. So, and we worked with many people from uh, the UK, uh, Canada, mm. uh, Italy, Germany. We had a very good uh, communicative uh, process within the country. And it was the first time that I really got to work as a, as a boss within a country with all these other people that were directing their country's activities against counter narcotics operations within a country. And it was an eye opening experience, wonderful experience. And I still have friends today that are British and Canadian and Aussies and so forth. So uh, it, it really uh, increased my purview on global aspects of things. Amazing. So I left Caracas in late 2012, and uh, I had gone through a program to work uh, in the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. I was trained uh, by the CIA, and then I was stationed as a DEA Supervisory Special Agent in Bogota, Colombia, where I worked counter narcotics operations as a liaison uh, with the Central Intelligence uh, Agency. So that was a that was a great experience as well, working all over the Caribbean and Colombia, working in narcotics operations, uh, you know, with the intelligence community, sharing and and making sure that we did the proper protocols and so forth uh, between DEA and and the intelligence community. And that was a wonderful experience that lasted three years. Wow. And, and then after that three year period that I went to Miami and I worked in what's called a 959 group, which is standing for a 959 is a law in which anyone who is attempting to bring drugs into the United States from around the world, wherever it might be, we have the authority to go and arrest them and bring them to the United States. That's the essence of the 959 law, Title 21 959. Okay. Oh, wow. So if someone is shipping drugs from, say, Cartagena, Colombia, through the Caribbean with its ultimate destination to Miami, Florida, or anywhere in the United States, even if it was in Bangor, Maine, mm. we, have authority. we can indict them and we can go after them, seek them and arrest them and eventually bring them to the United States, which we did. I had a wonderful group. It's a very specialized group of senior investigators that were top notch. Yeah. And we arrested well over 120 people and seized well over $30 million in total. Uh, and, and, but the drugs were over, over 100 tons of cocaine just in a couple year operation. So 100 tons of cocaine is a lot. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Coast Guard ships coming in with, you know, 14, 15, 20 tons at a time that we were seizing. So that was making a great impact on the street value uh, and the street quantity of cocaine with the United States mm -hmm. within reason. I say, you know, making an impact, we're talking about percentages, small percentages, but in the scope of the United States, that's a lot. It's a yeah. lot. So, but so how did was, they get these, may I ask, how did they get these things onto these ships when they know that they're crossing borders and they have to go through like, you know, duty and all this stuff. I just, so, so let me, mind. let me explain how this works. Right. So you, you, because you have a, you know, uh, uh, a clean mind, I will say, and you, you think, well, they have to come in through customs. That it doesn't work that way. So we have, yeah. that's we have what I'm asking. <laughs> low profile vessels. We have submarines, we have fishing vessels, we have refuelers, all these things are clandestinely, moving around the Caribbean, the Pacific, and the Atlantic Oceans, and they are moving with their illicit cargo. Mm. And when they come, they don't come to a port where the customs officials are. They're transferring to other boats, and then they bring that into the shores of the United States, for example, concealed on a fishing trawler in some port where there's no police. Mm. And then they offload it and bring it into the United States. 
same thing with uh, Europe, the UK, Canada, and so forth. So it's a series, it's a network of, of logistics operations, which are very finely tuned and they spend a lot of money on because they have the money, right? Yeah. So uh, they will take, they'll make the cocaine from the coca leaf and the paste in the jungles. They, they will, in Colombia, which is a primary source of cocaine for, for the world, let yeah. alone the Western hemisphere. They then transfer that to a ship. They'll send that ship out. They will have logistic refueling uh, operations in place to get that ship wherever it has to go. Yeah. Transfer uh, the cocaine to another ship, to another ship, to another ship, till it lands where it has to go in the United States. So are there people that are part of these shipyards or shipping things that are involved in getting the drugs or getting the narcotics onto these ships? Yes. It's, okay. it's basically a, it's a whole series and network of individuals that work for the cartels. Okay. And you can read about this extensively on the internet. There are many, many articles that you can read about how these systems work and, and how they employ their, their workers and ships and so forth, how they purchase. Uh, and that's maritime operations alone. Then you have an aviation operations area where they're launching, you know, aircraft, small aircraft, uh, mm -hmm. To, to Central America and Mexico, in fact, uh, so you understand. So if you're looking back in, say, 2006, 2007, they would have aircraft that would leave Venezuela. They would transfer the drugs from Colombia to Venezuela where they had a safe haven because the government there was implicit in protecting the cocaine movements from the FARC, which is the revolutionary arm of the movement within Colombia that has killed and and destroyed many aspects of, of Colombian culture, which they're now starting to come out of. They're starting to come out of that. There, there's a peace agreement. Uh, there's been some setbacks here and there, but they're, they're kind of repairing that system. Yeah. And they'll move the drugs and then they'll load them in an aircraft. So they'll take, say, a Cessna caravan. Just say a Cessna caravan. They'll load it up with cocaine and they'll even put extra tanks of fuel inside the aircraft with handmade hoses that go to the gas tanks so that it can last the flight long enough to get to Honduras or the north uh, northern Paten region of Guatemala. Yeah. And when they run out of fuel, they crash land the aircraft in a field. Oh, my and God. Have this, oh yes. These, these, <laughs> you know, these individuals are highly risk. Uh, you know, uh, their aptitude for risk is let's do it because the money is so great. You might have a pilot that could make just for flying one load, 50, 60, $70,000. And uh -huh. then, you know, you're not talking just small aircraft. Then you go to bigger aircraft, DC-9s and mm. so forth, that they would load up with cocaine. We're talking a jet. Mm. They will fly it and they will crash land it when there's no more fuel left. So, and then they take the cocaine from it and they, they have a ground network that will then bring it to the United States. So wow. then you can read about this online. Uh, there's some great stories about some of the seizures DEA and others have made, utilizing yeah. partners in different countries. The Guatemalans were fantastic. I trained the Kabiles and the, and the Cayman, which are the special forces, like almost like the Kabiles are the uh, Green Berets and the Cayman are the Navy SEALs of Guatemala. Very, very seasoned, uh, very well trained. And we would do training operations in preparation for different uh, enforcement operations that we would do. So, and they're very fruitful. We made a lot of seizures. So that's what, that was what was, was happening. Uh, over that whole time frame, time frame, continuing until, you know, I was in uh, Miami and still continues to this day. They just yes. kind of like, it's like the accordion, right? So whenever you put pressure on the Southwest border of the United States, say, you know, build the wall, build the wall. Okay. We build the wall. That accordion kind of shifts over to the Caribbean. Yeah, of course. So naval assets into the Caribbean with DEA providing the on the ground intelligence to the Coast Guard or the Navy. And it kind of shifts back. So it just keeps going back and forth, which is a natural thing. I mean, wherever the pressure is going to be, that's where the traffickers aren't going to be, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a constant battle to, to keep that. So, so do you think they'll ever win this battle? Um, no. It's going to be something that I liken it to this. I like to use this analogy. Violent crime is something that will never stop, but we don't want to just leave our, our presence and let it flourish. Right. Oh, no, of course not. No, no, I'm just for your viewers as someone that yeah. may be looking at this. It's 
a lot of times they're like, yeah, the war on drugs is a farce, the war on drugs is this, the war on drugs is this. Well, there are a lot of things about the war on drugs that are, in fact, not good. Yeah. There are many things that we could be doing better. But yeah. overall, the men and women that are working in this field, along with our partners around the globe, we're doing our best to try to slow and stammer the flow of the narcotics in, in order to maintain some kind of discipline within the homostasis, right? So we just say- so How do you think COVID's affected this? So uh, I think with COVID, you know, we have, uh, you can see in the news where there's a big push for naval operations in the Caribbean with re re relation to Venezuela, because Venezuela right now is a very sensitive topic. Uh, Venezuela is teaming up with some bad actor states like Iran and Syria and so forth. Iran is offering now uh, against the sanctions which uh, the United States and the UK have put on right. Iran uh, in, in a team effort, right, along with some other countries to, to stop their aggressive stance against uh, others within the region and the world. Right. And now Iran wants to ship missiles to Venezuela, which uh, that I don't believe will ever come to fruition. I don't think they'll allow it. And uh, COVID has not slowed that down. The border is still uh, uh, at a very high vigilant state. COVID okay. has not slowed that down. What has slowed down is the traffickers and their operations in some, in some ways with regards to their workers or their family being ill and so forth. So when the surges hit, I think that was impacting them. But if you look at recently, you have uh, 5,000 kilos were seized in Los Angeles coming from uh, cartels in Mexico. So I think they were taking some opportunities in recent weeks in order to take advantage of the lull of activity which the U.S. has seen. Mm. And they tried to get the cocaine into the United States and they were caught. So, you, and you can read about that. Uh, the LA Times has a lot of articles. There were two large seizures, some of the biggest in the United States in recent weeks. Wow. So viewers can can go look at that. So I think they were trying to take advantage of it, but they got caught with their pants down. Not a good thing. No. Not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of finish real quick, I, I know I'm taking a lot of time. No, no, I, that's fine. This is very interesting. <laughs> I, was in, I was in a few it's places, cycle. you know, I was in a few places. So I'll just wrap it up quickly. But I left Miami and I was promoted. I was a deputy uh, chief of, uh, section chief of the, financial operations section, which the financial operations section was dealing with global money laundering operations, mm -hmm. informant payments, and money laundering investigations, which you can read about online. You can read about what the DEA does and how we do, to a certain extent, money laundering operations, where we'll actually launder money in order to identify targets and bank accounts and then make seizures and so forth. So the inspector general has done extensive writings on this and your readers can read about it. There's a lot of overwatch on DEA about it. So it's not like we're just running around seizing money and saying, woo, let's go out and get a steak. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> exactly. It does not work that way. No, and that was part of my job to help run these programs on a global level, whether it's yeah. African continent, whether it's in Europe or South America or domestically within the United States or, or Great Britain, wherever it might be that we're working in partnership. Mm. Every country has their own rules, and so that changes too, right? So we have to have different permissions. And of course, that. and there's a lot of red tape. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that was my job for, for a few months. And then I was uh, tapped by the uh, deputy chief of operations to come up and be his executive officer, which uh, I did. And that mm. was uh, a great experience. I did that for a few more months. Mm -hmm. and, and during that time, I was basically the eyes and ears for the deputy chief operations. He was handling global issues uh, with military, other law enforcement agencies, investigations, OIG, which is Office of Inspector General, all those investigations. So he had a lot going on that he was running. And I would basically, I was like his left hand and right hand on many issues. And then we would meet at night and I would brief him and he would make decisions based upon certain things that I would brief him on. So I was just like a you know good XO for him. Uh, yeah. There were two of us actually. There were two of us because he had so much work. He had a lot on his plate, wow. and that was a great that was a great global position where I'm like seeing everything that's happening around the globe, 
and have yeah, a lot it's nice of, because then you also understand how the different systems and how the networks and how everything works and it's not yeah. just a one-dimensional perspective that's right yeah, i really understood how things are happening on a global scale right so yeah um, but then an opportunity came to go to Los Angeles and become the assistant special agent in charge there, which uh, I did in February of 2018. Okay. And, and so I moved to Los Angeles and I lived right downtown LA and wanted the experience of the city. Mm. And, and I would drive around at night, you know, and see the city lights and experience Sunset Boulevard and Hollywood and all these things. Mm. And uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And the work was great, too. I, I supervised uh, five and six different groups, uh, ranging from uh, a strike force group, which had DEA, FBI, HSI, uh, assistant U.S. attorneys and analysts and things like that, uh, doing mm. a variety of crimes, money laundering uh, group. And, and then I had... Uh, and how many in a group, if I may ask? Like, uh, it depends, right? So the strike force group, I want to say we had maybe 17, 18 people. And then we had uh, assigned three assistant U.S. attorneys that were supposed to work with the group. Uh, so, I mean, that's just one group, right? And then you have yeah, another, for sure. group, another group that might have seven or eight people in it, another group that might have five people in it, another that might have 12 in it. So I had six of those, and then I had some other groups that were more administrative, but really important groups that might have had 30 people in it. So, yeah. and it was a variety of things, right? A sensitive investigative group, which worked uh, terrorism nexus investigations all over the globe, um, and, and seizure uh, group that handled all administrative seizure information, things like that, uh, financial group that handled money laundering investigations of the highest level uh, in Latin America. So it was a mix of many different things. So I got to see, you know, the different investigations that they were all working on and, and we're very task force heavy. So when I say task force heavy, I say a lot of law enforcement officers are assigned to the groups working with us. Okay. So we have agents in law enforcement within the local communities working together. So that was uh, something that I was pretty accustomed to. That's what DEA does really well. And yeah. that was, you know, very interesting. And I did that for two years. And that's when I decided, you know, after, after being exposed to Hollywood a little bit, I say Hollywood, with a couple producers and a couple actors that I had gotten to train a little bit and talk mm -hmm. with and guide, reference some roles. Yes. That kind of sparked an interest in, you know, uh, working in the media and entertainment industry, which is something that I wanted to do, which kind of led me to want to write a book on Venezuela and what's happened in Venezuela. It's something that I was very interested in. I was very passionate about. Yes. Um, you know, I had my life threatened a few times <laughs> over the years, and that was yeah. uh, the place that seemed to, to kind of resonate the most with me. So I wanted to continue on with that. That was something yeah. that was very important to me. And so uh, I had retired. I started writing my book. I started speaking with some people. And next thing you know, I'm getting signed by United Talent Agency in New York City. Wow. Uh, Daniel Schmertz is my agent, and, and, and he's wonderful and great. And we're looking at some media and, and book opportunities right now. So um, I'm very excited. And it's, it's been a wonderful transition to do something different. I had spent the 30 years of my life in law enforcement. It was time. I felt I knew it was time to leave and and do something different, and I'm really enjoying it. Amazing, amazing. You yeah, obviously you filled in a lot of the blanks on the questions. So I wanted to talk about your leadership or the lack of leadership from both a professional and global perspective. So what do you believe makes your leadership style and so different in what you do? Obviously, because you know I know you retired, but like during that period there is an intense and massive responsibility um, in what you do when leading teams and operations. So what would you say has given you the edge in terms of leadership, especially in life-threatening situations and negotiations? And what do you believe needs to change to improve the current narrative in terms of leadership, both in your professional and on a global scale? I know that's a lot, but... No, no, it's actually not a lot because it's all kind of intertwined into the, the one twist, right? And one twist. Yeah. In that. And that's something that I see a lot, uh, especially on LinkedIn and social media. And I used to hear a lot with the Department of Justice was, 
you know, leadership, 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 leadership. I'm like, yeah. after a while, it's kind of like, okay, uh, leadership, you know, guys, <laughs> you know, okay, we get it. You know, we want to have leadership. Leadership is not something that uh, everyone is born with, right? No. And we all make mistakes. Yeah. We all, all do things that at times are like, what was I thinking, right? And that's part of the learning curve of being a leader and accepting things that you do right taking the glory for it. And then also, you know, taking the hits and accepting those hits and saying, you know what, I could have done better. Right. So when I look at leadership, it's about making sure that you're there for the people that are working for you. Okay. For me, it was always about that. It was always about how can I support the people that are doing the job and how can I make sure that I'm there to back them up when they need it? How can I get them the things they need to get the job done, right? Yes. And a lot of times what I've seen over the years is the shift in society as well as in the shift within these agencies is it becomes more about the individual propelling themselves to another level rather than taking care of the individuals and bringing them up, right? Mm-hmm. So what can I do for me kind of attitude, which is something that I did not want to get into that I w- if I fell into that trap, I saw myself going down that slippery slope. I try to pull myself up again and try to focus on the individuals that were working for me. Yeah. And I think in recent years, I, I would say probably the last probably six or seven, eight years, I've seen the agency and culture shift. And I noticed that I didn't move with it. I didn't realize this actually till, till later. So, huh. The mark was here and people were moving forward. And I was staying back at the old school, kind of like, you know, street agent guy, uh, you know, you know, I was just very casual about a lot of things. I wasn't so concerned about what everyone was thinking and it, things have become to the point now where you can't say anything without someone picking it apart. A hundred percent. Right. And And I never become a little bit ridiculous to be honest. Um, Exactly. But what you have is many leaders because they're so consumed about where they're going to go in their career is Mm. that they hesitate so much that they don't want to make a decision whatsoever or say something that could potentially damage their career. Mm. And I didn't care about that, Mm. especially as I, as I became through headquarters uh, as, as the deputy uh, section chief of financial operations, the XO, and then the assistant special agent in charge. I wasn't yeah. concerned about my career as much. Would I have liked to promote furthermore? Possibly. Mm-hmm. I did not enjoy being that administrative official that's making the decisions and kind of no. spitballing the ideas rather than doing the activities. But there's a natural progression. And, you know, they always say, you know, even John Wayne had to hang up his holster, right? So, <laughs> yeah, so that's something that I had, I had considered. And I thought, you know, and now I'm approaching 50, I need to kind of slow down a little bit and start looking about well, where are we in the agency? Do I need to adapt? Do I need to be more flexible? Do I may, need to make these changes? And that's something mm-hmm. that as, as a, a leader, you have to have that introspection. And I did not have that for a long time. And then I, I realized I, I needed to make some changes in my leadership style. Mm. I needed to do some other things in order to maybe adapt to what is it, you know, the expectations of what is occurring in the world right so Mm -hmm. and i and i did i I did do that but i just felt like i had done enough and it was time i didn't want to wait for a promotion for a few more years i i was feeling a little fatigued Mm -hmm. i had a lot during those times uh i had a lot of threats on my life and so forth i was uh getting a little fatigued and it was time i thought you know i'm not putting my best foot forward on everything Mm. I need, I think it's time for me to retire and seek something else that's more for me in my life and something I'm going to enjoy. And that's what I did. And yeah. it's been, it's been, it's been wonderful. I mean, my career with the government as a police officer and agent and so forth was fantastic. Mm. I can't tell you, you know, how much I love my old agency, but it was time to move on. And this mm. next bit of my life is just going to be, uh, if, you know, if not better, you know, yeah, for sure. And it's just an extension on your journey anyway. So. Yep. So you've had to deal with some of the most unscrupulous criminals in the world. This must have been extremely dangerous for you and your family. So how did you manage this? So 
my children growing up, they were always taught just to say, my dad works in computers. Oh, they, really? Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, my kids are all grown now, but uh, growing up, whenever they said, what's your dad do? He works in computers. Well, which was true. And I so said, you're not lying because I work with a computer every day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So, oh yeah, yeah. But in reality, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm at the house, uh, you know, a few hours a day and I'm working day and night. Sometimes I'd go get my car to go to work and I would not come back for four days, you know? So, and I'd come back having lost 15 pounds because I'm doing surveillance in my car for four days in a row and not really eating and high stress and all the, all those things. And, mm. and so I really tried to shield that, you know, from, from my kids as we were growing up. And I think they did, you know, they enjoyed themselves. And I think, um, you know, they didn't understand till they got a little bit older, other than the fact that I wasn't there a lot, mm. which the sacrifices, you know, that people make in a career field like law enforcement are very high. It's, it's yeah. kind of like the military as well, you know, uh, you know, uh, theirs is, is different, you know, uh, with military, obviously, they're going to war. What we're doing is a little bit different. It's not war typically in domestic situations. It's you're enforcing laws, which are very, you know, put you in precarious situations, very dangerous situations, and men and women die every day, mm. you know, working these enforcement operations, but you're working against the United States citizen, which you have to apply by, you know, these laws and protections under the Constitution, yeah. and the military has that in a different way, obviously, they're protecting according to protocols and things, and rules of engagement and so forth that are set with, you know, whether it be terrorists or foreign entities that want to take over something and then you know so there is a parallel there but it's very different but it, it has the same kind of effect on a person in law enforcement almost as military and, and you know uh, if i would have stayed in one location my whole career and worked 30 years in one town it would have been very distinct but i was in different countries I'm working with foreign you know working with and against you know uh different intelligence things and 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 then the threats coming from the cartels and drug traffickers obviously were something that were affecting me and my psyche without me really realizing it and well it's life. scary i mean <laughs> yeah it can it can be it can be just you know a little concerning play tricks um, on your mind well. yeah it could be i was pretty good at living with it and and i became very accustomed to it after a few of them you, you start saying no oh, this is not a big deal but realistically you know coming out of your door in the morning, most people don't have a gun in their hand and looking down the, you know, the hallways, both sides and then holstering and going with a plan to go where you're going to go mm. in an expedient manner, right? That's not how people leave their homes. That's yeah. how I do. That's, <laughs> and it's a habit that dies hard. I still do it to this day, you know, yeah. so, but I tried not to let my children see that whatsoever. So uh, my wife, on the other hand, she's had to deal with it. And we've had to like leave countries and go on a, you know, quote unquote vacation yes. for a few weeks until things calmed down. Yeah. And it was going to be okay for me to either return or make a decision where I had to go or, or things like that. So, and that was difficult. Uh, so that's an, a great alleviated aspect of retirement, right? So that kind of dissipates that, that yes. threat. Yeah. And so we made it, we made it so far. <laughs> and I think, you know, uh, now it's me normalizing my behaviors to try to find that, that kind of peace and stability again, where I'm not cons constantly being on the lookout for someone that's going to try to hurt yeah, me. Yeah, and looking over happen. your shoulder. Yeah. And I don't want to create this like hysteria, like uh, every day I'm just like concerned someone's going to grab me. That's not the case. But no. at times of threat levels which were high or I was being told I had threat levels that were high that's something that you had to take seriously obviously of course so what would you say some of your biggest lessons and learnings have been within your career I mean what stands um, out for you the most I mean I'm sure there's many but yeah yeah I think one of the greatest things that sticks out in my memory of of my work uh within the police department was the circumstances of your life can change in an instant. Um, I was involved in a shooting uh, where I was almost killed uh, six months on the job. I was 21 years old. Uh, individual had wanted to kill himself. The next thing you know, you know, he comes out of the house armed. He jumps in a car. There's a car chase and shooting and he's shooting and 
as we're chasing them. And, and this is actually on video. Uh, I have um, a link somewhere I could find it. But and then he gets shot multiple times. He ends up living, but I was almost killed in the shootout. And and uh, being 21 years old, I didn't understand fully at that time. Uh, you know, mortality is just around the corner, right? So when you're working at a dangerous profession, mm. uh, it can be something that's very tenuous. And and my old sergeant who just passed away a couple of years ago, he's my mentor in law enforcement. I carry a picture of him in my wallet, in fact. Mm. Uh, he saved my life on a couple of different occasions when I was an officer. But he had given me, after that shootout, a couple of days later, we went to the roll call, which is, you know, where you go and you get briefed for the activities of your patrol. Mm. For that day. And he presented me with a best dancer in a shootout award for not <laughs> And, and so he and this guy had shot seven people in his career. He was very experienced and a very, very good street cop. And wow. I learned a lot from him. His name was uh, Charles Hinkle, a wonderful, wow. wonderful policeman. Uh, really taught me a lot. But uh, the point in that is you have to find that outlet of, of release within the jobs. And that is like he was trying to obviously bring the humor into the situation, even though it was something very serious where I almost lost my life that day. Yeah, absolutely. Learned that was something that could use as a coping mechanism. And then when I went to the federal government in 2001, I was not working. I was off duty. I was struck by a drunk driver and broke my neck. And I had broke um, C3, 4, 5, and 6. They had removed a lot of bone and fused my neck, which I'm actually in uh, fine condition now. At the time, I had a spinal cord. I still have a spinal cord injury. I can't feel my right arm. Mm. And I had about some other issues, but I'm able to run, jump, work out, do whatever I want to do right now. So I'm very fortunate. But for the weeks before that, uh, after I had been struck by this vehicle, I was paralyzed wow. and, and, and able to move from the neck down. I had been trapped in the car. It was a very surreal experience to be in a situation where you're absolutely paralyzed. And I thought, wow, if this is my life, I don't know if I can handle this. You know, yeah. I mean, it's a lot of people don't think about it when they see someone in a wheelchair or so, so forth, but no. it's something that is so frightening and so you're, you have no control over anything except no. for your mouth and your eyelids yeah. and your respiration. So as I'm trapped in this car, I'm thinking this is going to be the rest of my life. Now, luckily I recovered. Um, the surgery went well months later, you know, after therapies and, but continuing for over a year, I learned to walk again, use my arms uh, slowly over that year period. And I regained control to where I could go back to work. And this is the focal point of the story. When I went back to work, my, my boss, his name was Mark Heim. He was the resident agent in charge when I was in Des Moines, Iowa. Wonderful man. I learned a lot from him. Very patient, very kind individual, which is a rarity within the Drug Enforcement Administration. That's a joke. I mean, you picture, <laughs> you picture DEA guys as, you know, the rough, gruff, you know, yeah, yeah. whipping out the pistol kind of thing. Mark was a very intelligent. Uh, he had been a uh, former, we call it diversion investigator, which works with pharmaceutical drugs. He was very knowledgeable of the science of pharmaceuticals and, mm. and he had worked that job for some time. So he's, he's very, very keen on every aspect of what DEA does because DEA does enforcement and then they do diversion. They take care of the doctor's licenses and the pharmacy license and they do the accountability factor with regard to the medical realm. So okay. he was a very well-rounded guy and he had me come back to work. I had no business being there. I mean, I could barely walk, Yeah. but I had to go back to work or I wasn't going to go back to work kind of thing where yeah. I had been off for seven months or so. And he would come over and mow my lawn at my house and, bring food and so forth. He was very supportive, extremely mm. supportive. And when I came back to work, he just told me, sit at that desk and don't move. I was, wow. uh, thank God, because I can't move. I'm in so much pain. <laughs> and he took care of me. But going back to, you know, the lessons and, and things of that nature. So with me, uh, I think back on how DEA, you know, can make such a difference in people's lives just by being a human being and treating people uh, in a fashion in which you're taking care of them to the greatest extent possible, which he did. And mm. I'll never forget that. It sticks to my mind. You know, uh, it'll be uh, 20 years this April that I had my accident. So wow. it's something that is 
uh, resonates with me to this day. And I tried to emulate that in many aspects of my career uh, as I was supervising people. Wow. Sure. So you've had obviously incredibly diverse career in law enforcement and having seen it all, what would you say have been some of the biggest challenges while working with cross-border international law enforcement, both internationally within the U.S. and on an international level? So the challenge is this, and I'll sum this up, it's relationships. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't have relationships with these global partners, you're not going to get things done. This no. is not one-man band, okay? This is something that requires multiple agencies around the globe, and that's something that DEA does very, very well. In fact, I want to say we have 79 offices, 76 or 79 offices, it might be even more now, around the globe, and each office has the responsibility of, of being able to foster those relationships in order to enable a cooperative effort to tackle these drug, these drug networks. And mm. drug networks have the funding required, they have more funding than us often, they have the logistical expertise to do what they want to do, the banking, the professionals, the accountants, they have everything. And they don't play by the rules like we do. So they have a lot of advantages, which is even more important that we maintain these global partnerships. If I'm doing an investigation out of Bogota, Colombia, that is in Panama, that is in Mexico, that's in the UK, that's in Australia or New Zealand, Mm. I know as a DEA agent, I can pick up the phone and I can reach someone at any of those offices that has a control or responsibility over it. And in doing that, uh, it provides me that tactical support and the ability to reach anywhere in the world and conduct these investigations. It's about partnerships. Yes. And that's something that DEA does very well. Amazing. So you are now the CEO and president of the Celebrity Group. So you did touch on it earlier, but can you please share with us more uh, what the group does and how having such a diverse career in law enforcement helped you to diversify into the work you do now? Sure. So I came up with the idea when I retired. Actually, I was in the mountains of uh, Idaho and Montana uh, after I had initially retired, just kind of decompressing, right, from 30 years of <laughs> doing all these things to all of a sudden I'm in the mountains <sighs> catching my breath you can right? breathe. <laughs> and actually I had a hard time breathing because I was almost at 7,000 feet <laughs> the dichotomy of it all yeah. but I'm spiritually and mentally I was breathing right even though yeah. I was suffering from altitude sickness not altitude sickness but I was I was feeling the effects yeah. and I said well I want to do something very different than what I had done in the past I would like to do some investigative work, which I, I still do. I, I do some things for international investigative uh, 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 companies and so forth on contract. It's something that I, I feel I'm good at and I enjoy, but I really want to do something in the media realm. And what can I do in the media? And I started thinking, well, I've met with actors from Netflix. I've met from producers in different, different uh, avenues in, in uh, Hollywood. And I've met with some radio personalities and I've had opportunities with DEA to do these things. So hmm. I said, oh, well, maybe I could do something with, you know, uh, the movie TV industry. Hmm. Maybe I could do something in the text publishing area of uh, books, right? Hmm. So I started coming up with a plan in my mind to do something while I'm sitting there. This is, you know, three weeks after I retire. I just can't. Hmm. You know, rest too long, right? No. <laughs> and I start making these plans and I design the website and I start engaging to my partners, uh, Chad Kuski, who's a former Dev Crew Navy SEAL, uh, the elite of the elite. Um, unbelievable background of this guy with 300 combat missions, uh, 20 years in the, in, the, in the SEAL teams, and then finally reaching wow. the people of Dev Crew. You can Google Dev Crew and see what that see what that is everyone will probably recognize it when they start looking at it and then sean steinway is a weapons expert and international trainer uh, a very fluid instructor tactical firearms uh, a very adept former marine uh, former uh, siu commander that worked underneath my command when i was in guatemala siu is sensitive investigative units they're foreign law enforcement officers that work with dea exclusively and we vet them they're congressionally funded most oftentimes 
and we work hand in hand. So I had a great level of trust. Sean was a, a U.S. citizen living in Guatemala. He has family that's Guatemalan. And we just happened to run into each other when he applied for the job to be the commander of the of the SIU at Guatemala, and I was helping pick it. And wow. we've continued with the relationship to this day. So I said, hey, guys, I want you to come in with your tactical experience, mm. uh, personal protection avenues. It was one of the things we do as well as the media consulting and movies, TV, radio, um, and, and also video games and things of that nature. So when people want to make a video game about something that's relevant to whether it's uh, law enforcement, uh, drug enforcement, military, we will provide counseling on that and consulting services. So, so between all these different genres that we're doing, uh, I really meant a lot to me to do something in the media world with regard to print, right? So I really want to write a book. I want to write a couple books. Yes. Uh, I have all this energy and I want to write these books and I want to talk about my first book being that of Venezuela and the plight of the Venezuelan people and the regime change that's so, so necessary right now. And what, what started with Chavez continues with Maduro in the, in the areas of narcotics trafficking and, and support material support of terrorism that they are conducting with the FARC and so forth. The, you know, the destabilization uh, within the Western hemisphere and around the world and the nexus with, Hezbollah, Iran, and so forth, and the different proxies within Venezuela that are that are creating such havoc in the world, and that's going to be my first first project, which I can't get into too much at this point. But I have uh, some inquiries from a producer that I think uh, are going to work out, and we'll see, and we'll start from there and work that toward a docu series, and then we'll see what happens after that. Amazing. So what would you say some of your biggest career highlights have been and what are the most uh, rewarding experiences within your career been? So I look at career highlights as the overall experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, and which is good and bad, right? So I have these great experiences that have gone over 30 years of my life, all the different people that I've met, good and bad. Mm -hmm. Um, the interactions I've had with them, the friendships, the loss of friendships, the, the mistakes I've made, the things I've learned, everything compiled into one. Mm. And I look at that as an overall positive in one realm. And then I look at the second column as I really don't remember my life that much. So I don't remember a lot of occasions where I should remember like different birthdays of my children or anniversaries or different things that joy and family interactions because I was working constantly yes. constantly there was one point in my life where I was required to work um, it was about a nine month period I had two days off and I was working 18 to 23 hours a day literally where I would sleep one or two hours a night for months on end so um, you know that's not conducive to remembering a lot of experience in, no. <laughs> of what you're doing in your life, right? So it's a, not. it's a great sacrifice that a lot of people besides myself paid for that, right? Mm. It's a massive so sacrifice too. It really was. So I look at the great things and then the sacrifices and I kind of put them all together and I say, well, this was my life. Mm. I have to embrace it. I have to accept it. What can I do differently in the future? And what can I do with respect to making myself more abundant in my own, my own consciousness, right? So how can I make this better? And, and that's why doing something mostly separate from my previous life is important to me. So, uh, but yeah, so, you, you know, the experiences and all those things, I don't kind of lump it into like one or two things. One in my or two, life. Yeah. I try to bring it into a complete scope because there's just been many, many things where we might have saved. I had, one thing that stands out in my mind, I had uh, a call where a guy wanted to commit suicide by cop, which is, you know, they try to force you to shoot them. Okay. Oh, so not everyone's experienced that, but I had that uh, where I responded uh, to a man with a gun who said he was going to kill people. We responded, we get there. He's concealing his hands. He's hunched over. We, he's like, I have a gun. He tells us, I have a gun. I'm going to kill you. And as he turns around and I have a shotgun, and I'm ready to shoot him because he's going to kill me. I mean, I have, there's no, there's no alternatives. I can't say, oh, dude, time out. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Let's get a you coffee. Can't reason I mean, it with doesn't work that way. Unreasonable. <laughs> he's absolutely despondent. He's not even seeing me. He's just in a, in a daze. 
mm. uh, whether it's alcohol, drugs, and, and his emotional state. Mm. And he turns around. As he turns around, I see his hand, but no weapon as he's turning it to me. And now this happens in a fraction of a second. Mm. I had just arrived on the scene. Five seconds before, I'm out of the car with the shotgun, telling him to show me his hands. I'm going to kill you. And he turns around. And in a matter of a fraction of a second, I have to make a decision if I'm going to shoot him or not shoot him. And luckily, I had a good view of him. Mm. And my partner, who had rolled up too, didn't, couldn't see as well as I could. I said, he doesn't have a gun. Mm. I'm screaming, he doesn't have a gun. And he does this. And my partner said, he's like, why? Why? He almost shot him. We both almost shot him. Wow. And luckily we didn't. And yeah. then he just fell to his knees sobbing and we went and picked him up, you know, and brought him to a mental health facility where he got help, you know? Okay. So those moments are good moments where, you know, you did the right thing and you feel good. And then there are other moments when things are, are tragic and you do your best and it doesn't work that way you know, where yeah. uh, people might kill themselves or others in front of you and you had just absolutely no opportunity to stop it. So getting back to, like you said, I, I kind of stay away from these singular items because how do you pick out these singular items within a No, of course years? you can't. <laughs> and I just kind of put them together and kind of put them in the perspective. Yeah, for sure. So COVID-19, we obviously touched on that from the drug perspective, but it's obviously turned our world inside out and upside down. So how would you say from your professional standpoint um, and personal perspective, have you had to adapt and can you give us some examples? So for me, I look at it a little bit different than a lot of people because, you know, so I left the federal government. I started a company which takes developmental time over a computer. Yes. Remotely. I can do a lot of things remotely and that's what I did. So I used that time as efficiently as I could to kind of like decompress from life mm. as well to start this new career kind of thing. Right. So I had a good for the last, you know, seven months, eight months time to develop my business, to develop the networking, to reach out to people, meeting people like you, wonderful people like you who are doing these hundreds of broadcasts and creating opportunities for people and doing outreach and, and, and doing your part in your, in your business community. And then, I, so I have had that time to do that. So for COVID for me has been good to kind of be isolated. I'm glad yeah. I'm isolated because I was just so uh, all, over the place. <laughs> all over the place. This has just been a breath of fresh air for me. So yeah. it's been an opportunity to gather myself and build this company up, uh, you know, on, on these different medias so that I can start getting clients, which is starting to occur now. And more importantly for me to focus on my real love, which is to get my media my medium uh, products, number one, a producer and, and potentially, you know, uh, uh, a publisher and so forth to come together, make a product and then take this product to the next level. I do have a, a current show that we're kind of shopping around right now, but it's not a very law enforcement environment in, in TV. Mm. And that's an international fugitive uh, TV show, kind of like a, almost like a live PD thing, but in the international realm where I go and work with different entities around the world, law enforcement entities or military operational entities. And we look for fugitives and we document that on film and then I'm the host and so forth. So right now that's uh, kind of like on the back burner until things become a little bit more calm in the realm of law enforcement, even yeah. though mine is not so much strict law enforcement, it's outside of the country um, you know, whether it's Australia or New Zealand or UK, whatever it might be, mm. I want to develop that kind of TV show in addition to the other things I've talked about. So getting back for me, like I said, it's a good thing. COVID's been kind of good for me in that aspect. I've made the best out of it, even though I understand that many people are suffering and, and stalling in their business, unfortunately. Yeah. So you've been trained by some of the top law enforcement, and you did touch on this earlier, but um, I just want to elaborate. Some of the biggest or top law enforcement agencies in the world and worked with the DEA and the FBI, which is no easy task. So how and where do you believe you got your skills and discipline to stay focused, loyal, and work with the utmost integrity, especially when working in extremely difficult or sensitive situations? And you obviously have to have an incredible discipline when dealing with sensitive information. 
what was the training process for you and has this helped you in other aspects of your life? And if so, can you give us some examples? Sure. So I won't get into specifics of training. For well, sure. And I understand. Things. And <laughs> you're not asking that. But yeah. for, the, for viewers, if they're like, oh, he's got No, I'm not. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I didn't do that. So basically going through a multiple of training from local law enforcement to federal law enforcement to, mm. to the intelligence community and so forth. And then implementing that in real life situations over the last 30 years and combining that experience to move forward. It's taught me that you have to be extremely patient yet aggressive. So, and I'm not saying passive aggressive, you have to be extremely patient in your modes and methods is what you're doing, but yet in, you have to be extremely accelerant in your aggressiveness toward the future of your investigation. What okay. do I mean? I always think three, four, five steps ahead when I'm looking at something that I'm going to do. If I have trafficker A that's delivering to trafficker B, I'm looking at everyone in between C, D, E, and F. And F. <laughs> Whenever someone yeah. would come and talk to me or I was looking at an investigation, I always wanted to look three or four steps ahead. Mm -hmm. Not that I was focusing on everything at once because you can only juggle so many balls, right? Mm -hmm. But I always had in mind that I wanted to know what that end game was going to be and how am I going to succeed in the best way possible, mm -hmm. utilizing the resources I had. And I, I, I found it best to always say you have to be patient, but yet aggressively pursuing the outcome, right? So things will fail. Things will not go right. Things will happen all the time. It's difficult to not have that immediate reaction where you're like, oh, man, I, I, that's not good. Mm. What am I going to do? The world's crashing, you know, cry wolf. No. Okay, goes bad. What's our, our secondary avenue? What's our tertiary avenue? I would always have these things in my mind. I learned to have a second and third plan, right, to be flexible. Mm. And that's something DEA typically was always extremely good at. Some federal agencies, which I won't name their names, but mm. if anyone's watching this, they'll know, and they're law enforcement, they'll know who I'm talking about. Mm. Very rigid in their operational plans and execution. So, and DEA is very flexible. They always have been. And that's one of their strengths. Right? Yes. So for me, it was that patient, aggressive planning and the flexibility to, to always maneuver around the problems and obstacles. If you don't have that, you're not going to be successful, period. No. And that's what I learned over the course of the 30 years. Wow. Amazing. So you've led and trained foreign government, uh, Supreme Court justice, federal prosecutors, immigration and police in law enforcement. So what do you believe led you into this aspect of your career and with the current state of affairs in the U.S. with police officers and law enforcement itself, how do you believe things need to change? And what do you believe can be done better? And can you give us any examples? So I'll tell you a successful example. In, in, the, in the early 2000s when, when I was in Guatemala, mm. they, they wanted to create uh, some new laws with regard to telephonic interception. And... Mm. I was working with a retired FBI agent who was a contractor in the embassy mm. in the ambassador and narcotics affairs section uh, within the embassy and the Guatemalan officials, mm. uh, including the, what they could say, the Fiscalia, which is like the, the, U, the U.S. attorney or the attorney general or the deputy okay. attorney general. Yeah. And the Supreme Court and so forth would make rulings on different things later, but and what we wanted to do was model the system after what we do in the United States, which mm. gives protections to individuals. And there has to be a probable cause and a reason to go seek a warrant for interception, right? Mm. Within the country. Mm. So we're just, we're not going into the country and saying to the Guatemalans, you know, let's just tap everyone's phone and just go crazy and see what we get. We're not doing it. <laughs> so we yeah. started with these round tables and what they wanted and what, they wanted to pursue and they were requesting help from us and it was a great partnership and we developed the law that is currently in use today mm -hmm. in Guatemala it's implemented and fantastic and I had the opportunity to train uh, many of their equivalent to our US assistant US attorneys uh, uh, including multiple Supreme Court justices from Guatemala and how do we enforce our our what we say title three laws 
hmm. wiretap laws within the United States. And I provided multiple seminars, uh, some were a week, some were three days, some were two days and meetings and so forth, roundtables, in order to accomplish that. Hmm. And that is the essence of what we want to do all around the globe, right? When someone asks the United States for help in this, in this particular niche that we have, say, drug law enforcement, right? Hmm. But we also have things that are linked in nexus to uh, uh, counterterrorism operations and so forth. So we have a variety of things, money laundering, counterterrorism. We have controlled deliveries that are conducted from country to country where we take drugs and we deliver them to another country. That country takes them and delivers them to the bad guy and we make arrests and so forth. So all these different things are what we're trying to implement across the globe using our expertise, because DEA is, the, in my view, the the premier drug enforcement agency within the globe, in my view. Now, that doesn't mean we're better. I'm not yeah. saying that. But what I'm saying is, I think we have offices in the outreach and the abilities and the resources to do these things on a global scale better than most other countries. So, and we want to emulate others in what they do in their country and work with them, obviously, within their rules. That helps you make you better, right? Absolutely. It, you know, that was the key, right? Yeah. So, and that was the learning process that, that we went through as we went from country to country or region to region, learning how they operate and what they do, the social norms, the social do nots, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we learned what we could and could not do. So all of those things being said, it was critical and, and, and it paid off for us in that level with respect, like the example I gave in Guatemala. It's a, it's the law that's flourishing today. They're using it to the utmost, uh, utmost uh, success uh, that they can, but yet they're still protecting the rights and, and, and of their citizens. Wow, amazing. So having had an incredible career in law enforcement, what do you believe you do differently within your own agency or your own work? Um, and what do you believe is different and unique about your perspective? that has given you the ability to be different? So for me, you know, I'm, I'm no different than anyone else. Um, I think I've had some unique experiences that, that have, uh, in fact, uh, I've drawn from various positions that I've had over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't in one place. I wasn't in two places, three places. I worked in seven in seven of the DEA field divisions out of all the field divisions in three three countries. I worked with the intelligence community. I was trained by the intelligence community. I was trained by the FBI with regards to tactical operations with SWAT and so forth. So, you, when you pull that in, all that information together, you look at it. To me, I don't think it's something special. But a lot of people are like, "Wow, you have a lot of experience." And I guess I do have a lot of experience. But the bottom line is, no matter where you are, what you've done, whatever field you're in, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's drug law enforcement, whether it's uh, intelligence, whether it's in business, whether it's in your business, linking people up with entities that are going to promote their media products and, 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 and get them where they want to go. It all comes down to personality, perseverance. And, and I really believe, the, you know, when you're tackling these issues and problems, it's like I said, you have to have that patience ability with the progressive, aggressive thinking about what you're gonna get done. Mm. But you have to have that calm, steady factor of what am I gonna to do to get there, that planning and so forth. So I don't look at it as I'm like something special. I look at it as something like I've had these something special opportunities given to me yeah. and I use those to my benefit. And they really have created, in my view, they've really created the ability for me to have a global perspective on things because I've worked on a global scale Mm. in multiple jurisdictions over multiple years and multiple different types of investigations. So yeah. Well, that is, it gives you an advantage, right? I feel it has. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I want to talk about social media and how this tool has helped you or others work or in the work that you do. Cause I'm assuming that there are, you know, during your investigations, people are also tracking through social media, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So although it has a lot of um, positives, it also has a dark and dangerous side. So what do you believe needs to change the current situation to use these tools more responsibly? And how, from both perspectives, has this helped you in your work and what you do? Sure. So 
for me, when I look at social media, I look at it from a, from a lens of what are people doing right and wrong as far as safety and, and security. I just yes. can't help, I can't help myself, right? <laughs> One of those things that's just built into me. Yeah. So when I see someone giving, uh, in fact, I had seen this from, a, from an individual that's very experienced, has tens of thousands of followers, mm. and was doing a live, a live broadcast. Mm. And during the live broadcast, some personal information, I'll just say personal information had been displayed over a period of time on the, on the podcast, on the live, live show. Mm. And I actually DM'd him and said, hey, I can see this, 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 and this. And he's like, oh, my God, I didn't even think about that, right? Yeah, exactly. Because with that personal information, give up where you live, where you are, what you're doing, and all these things. And, and I wrote an article on this on LinkedIn mm. um, uh, some time ago about uh, security and, and what we need to do and how we have to be cautious and careful as we're mm. posting and doing things. For example, Kim Kardashian, mm. all the money in the world, but yet she gets you know, bound and held up in her own apartment in Paris, France by some people that wanted to take her money and things. Mm. Okay. So how does this happen? What's the breakdown? Where's the breakdown and what is going on? Mm. You have an individual that has all the money in the world to hire the best professionals possible, right? And that's a whole nother story, right? What's the best possible as far as a professional, right? Do you want the guy that's eight foot tall, 300 pounds that, you know, walks around beating people up? Or do you want the person that has the experience in which he can draw from mm. for the long haul in regard to overall intelligence, application, avoidance, and all the things that need to be done when you're doing personal protection, right? Yeah. Total, because many of these attacks and many of these things are not done in a split second. They're planned. They progress and all these other things. So mm. my point was when we're using social media, there's always a level of giving up that freedom of protection and privacy of and course. you really understand that but when you're on your phone constantly and you are on social media tweeting and and spouting everything in your life you're giving up a lot of information right mm -hmm. i don't typically do that and it's not something i need to do for my business you know i don't want to be on tiktok on a skateboard per se i probably can't no. that. <laughs> that, that's just not what i do right so yeah. But that doesn't mean that I want to crawl under a shell and kind of crawl around peeking my head out occasionally. You know, I want people to understand that they can reach me on LinkedIn and celebrityconsultinggroup.com and so forth. And they can email me or call me or whatever it needs to be done. But it's in but, your control. That's the difference. It is. And everyone has to, everyone has to consider that because you really don't know who you're talking to until you get to know them a little bit and verify mm -hmm. who they are and what they do. Yeah. So, you know, and there's just, a lot of trolls and catfish and predators and it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you have to be very cautious and that doesn't mean paranoid, but no. cautious. There's a big yeah. difference. Yeah. So cautious, do your homework, do some simple things just to kind of indicate who this individual is. If something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. So trust mm -hmm. your gut on that stuff. Mm -hmm. 100%. So what would you say the three key pieces of advice you would give to anyone looking to pursue a career in law enforcement or even entrepreneurial, because obviously you're kind of shifting to the entrepreneurial aspect of business. And then what legacy would you like to leave or how would you like to be remembered? So my advice to someone getting into law enforcement is this, irregardless of the tone and tenor of the conversation that's occurring in the United States and around the globe, primarily focused right now in the United States with regards to police, police brutality and police tactics and methods, all these things. Police work is an honorable profession with these men and women that risk their lives every day for all of the citizens in the United States. They work within the confines. They do the best they can. There's always going to be the bad apples in any of profession, course. irregardless. Yeah. I'll in totality, law enforcement officers, men, women of all races, all creeds, all religions are out there doing the job for you and me to make sure that we're safe and we're protected. If we lose that, our country will collapse. It yeah. will collapse. So it's, it's extremely important that people understand and they do not listen to all the static out there. And I say the static with all the news media about how police are bad and how this is bad and this. 
you know, there are bad people, but we're going to focus on the hundreds of thousands of police officers that go every day and risk their lives. Some of them don't get to go home at night. Many of them in the United States, you know, every day we're losing and law enforcement officers being shot, run over, stabbed, or losing their life due to some kind of trauma because they're doing their job. So that's the first thing. So if you decide to go into law enforcement, the second, second thing you must understand is it's a sacrifice that will cost you a lot in your lifetime, okay? Sure. And when I say cost, emotional cost, financial cost, it's going to cost you with your family. It's going to cost your time, and, and which is precious, right? So you have to understand law enforcement is not a job. Mm. It's a calling. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, so people have to understand that's my second point that it's a calling. It's something that you don't get into because you want a good 401k because you're going to be doing things that your life depend on and others will depend on not only your partners and in the law enforcement community, but for us, when you look at constitutionality, right? So you're upholding the constitution of the United States through the applicable laws and the enforcement thereof, right? So that is extremely critical. They, they understand the, the depth and magnitude of what they're going to be doing. Yes. And the third thing that I would say with regard to, you know, people that, that are thinking about a law enforcement career is you can do a many things to kind of see if it's really something that you want to do. You can go to an auxiliary. You can do, you can do things with reserve police. Mm. You can do all these uh, different things, especially if, if you have a child that's, say, 16 years old, and he said he wants to be a police officer, go to the Boy Scouts, uh, you know, and, and the Boy Scouts have the Law Enforcement Explorers Program. Many law enforcement uh, officers and departments still do that today. Mm -hmm. Idea if that's what something they want to get into before they make that full committal. Mm -hmm. And that'll give them that base to kind of understand that this is something that I do or do not want to do. Amazing. And the last thing is... How would you like to be remembered or what's your legacy? You know, it's, it's not as much about being remembered. Mm -hmm. I think what I want to do is be a representative of the law enforcement community and the whole of what we do mm -hmm. for the people that we protect and the people we represent. Yeah. And I don't like to paint the picture. I like to have that mosaic of little bits that are put together to form the, the total picture. I'm um, just one of those little bits that form that mosaic, right? Mm, yeah. Mosaic. So, so I think that's something that is, it's not about the individual more so than it is about the collective group. I yeah. don't ever want to be that person that wants to say, well, it's the highlight of what I've done. I don't mind yeah. talking about things I've done. I think what I've done are important, but I think it has to be, you know, um, a coming together type attitude of everyone that is making this push for our United States of America. Yes, absolutely. So thank you so much for your time today. And uh, if people want to reach out to you, what are the best platforms to do? So I know you mentioned it earlier, but just to yeah, sure. <laughs> so just celebrityconsultinggroup.com. My email's there. Just go on there, take a look at uh, myself and my partners. Chad Kuski and Sean Steinway. Look at the services we offer. Um, I have some separate stuff that I do with investigative uh, avenues, which is limited. I'm pretty selective in that, uh -huh. in the foreign environment. So for businesses that need certain investigative activities in a foreign environment, not within the United States, uh -huh. uh, I do that as well. So, uh, but our services that we offer are training and consulting and media projects, whether it's movies, whether it's books, uh, things of that nature. And we also have a personal protection uh, entity where we employ uh, veterans, uh, former Navy SEALs and Special Forces individuals are highly trained in what they do and some of the best in the world. And, and, and we use them to help provide security and assessments and so forth around the globe. So that's something that we offer as well. So it's great that we can help these veterans. Yes, of course. Law officers uh, do what they're really good at and provide a service that is enriching the lives and protecting people. Amazing. Well, thanks so much, Wizzy, for your time today. And hopefully we can have you back in the future to see Anytime. where you are in your next uh, chapter. And thanks so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you so much and have a great afternoon. I appreciate being here. Thanks for giving me the opportunity.
Thanks. Take care. Okay. Bye.